Good morning once again, everyone. Today we're going to return to the prophet Jeremiah. We'll be in Jeremiah chapter 2 to begin with this morning, Jeremiah 2. And I just want to say a couple words of, uh, in preface to what we're going to look at today. So I'm entrusted by God to communicate his word to people. And here's the thing. Of all the books of the Old Testament, Jeremiah might be the longest, really. Only 52 chapters. Isaiah has 66. You might think Isaiah is longer, but it's not. When it comes to word count and volume, Jeremiah is huge. Uh, you could prob- I'm told you can take all the minor prophets, roll them all together, they would still not equal the volume of Jeremiah. So Jeremiah is long, and there's lots there. But Jeremiah emphasizes certain things, and if I'm going to be a good Bible teacher, I have to emphasize those things that Jeremiah emphasizes. I can't, I can't just skip through Jeremiah and cherry-pick the things that make us feel good. That would, that would not be very responsible, would it? So I'm defending myself right now <laughs> against any uh, critique that may come later in terms of... Um, the content of what we're going to look at. I must emphasize what Jeremiah emphasizes. Remember that Jeremiah functioned as a prophet. He's of the priests also, mind you, priest and prophet during the last years of Judah's kingdom. Remember, Israel split into two, Israel in the north, Judah in the south. Judah fared better than Israel in the north. They didn't, up in the north, they didn't have one righteous king, just one bad king after another, beginning with Jeroboam the first who becomes sort of the standard of uh, false religion and blasphemy and and all those wonderful things. But in the south, in Judah, you have at least eight righteous kings, kind of, out of a whole roster of terrible kings. So they lasted longer. But uh, judgment is coming to Judah also. And Jeremiah was called to witness to the people in those final years before Babylon was given permission by God to come march westward and just obliterate the city, knock the temple to the ground, loot it, and drag the Judeans off into exile, and into Babylon, 70 long years into exile. Jeremiah is witnessing to the people, preaching to them, pleading with them in the years leading up to this tragedy, and his message is actually pretty simple. It's a pretty simple message, and he repeats it over and over again. The message is, God has been good to you people. God has been faithful. He has been a covenant keeper. I mean, just look at your redemptive history. You know, you can just bring that over into your own life, too. I can bring that over into my life. God's been good to me. He's been good to my family. He's been good to this church. He's been good to us as individuals and as a church community. He has, sure, he has shown a lot of grace a lot of patience with us, a lot of favor. He's been a covenant keeper to us. He was a covenant keeper to Judah, too. But his message to Judah was, you've been faithless to God. You've been rebellious. You've been a covenant-breaking nation. And so Jeremiah says to his contemporaries, repent. You must repent. Repent. And that's just, you know, that's a fancy religious term. You hear the word repent. What does it really mean? It just means think again. The Greek term means think again. The implication is you're thinking differently now. I thought one way about God and about his word and about his offer to save me, but now I'm thinking differently. I have repented. Jeremiah says, I want you to change your thinking, people, and change your conduct, because if you don't, God is going to punish this nation exactly the way he promised in the Mosaic Law. He is going to send the Gentiles into this place, and we're going to be severely, severely chastened, punished. Gentile aggression, military conquest, subjugation, and finally exile. And you read Jeremiah, read Lamentations, it's awful. It's absolutely awful. It's ghastly what God allowed those Gentile invaders to do to his people. You talk about people being victimized, You talk about people in desperation in times of famine brought on by war. It's awful. I'm not even going to read those verses audibly in the service. But you can read them. And here's the thing. God didn't want to do it. Did you know that? God God is not willing that any should perish, the Bible says. He, He wills that all men be saved. Paul wrote that. 
1 Timothy 2.4, God wills that all be saved. God didn't want to go through with this. He wanted these people to repent. In fact, Jeremiah himself said it in Lamentations, the third chapter. He says, God does not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. God is not up there in heaven just waiting for some excuse to hurt people, to punish people, to chasten them. That is not, God is a good father. Good fathers don't treat their children like that. And God is a good father. That's why he pleads with the people through the prophets, through the testimony of the prophets, pleading with them chapter after chapter. Look at Jeremiah 2, please, verse 4. Jeremiah 2, 4. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. By the way, that's a little clue that Jeremiah is going to be speaking to people who are, who are living in an age future to his own. Because there really is no Israel at this time, is there? Israel was sort of yanked away a hundred years earlier over to Assyria. The Assyrians uh, conquered Israel, took the, 12, uh, excuse me, the ten tribes hostage, captive, and yet Jeremiah still recognizes Israel. I think he is giving us inscripturated special revelation that the Jews of our own day should be reading and taking to heart. But in any case, he references the house of Jacob and all the families of the house of Israel. Verse 5 now, Thus says the Lord, What injustice have your fathers found in me that they have gone far from me? They have followed idols and have become idolaters. You know, that sort of sounds like Jesus. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, Jesus confronted the religious leaders who were largely hostile against him and his claims and his followers. And in John 8, 46, he asks them, point blank, which of you convicts me of sin? Let's hear it. You're aligned against me? You call me demonized, a blasphemer, and so on? Now let's have it. The details. Which of you convicts me of sin? And you know what the response was? Stunned silence. That's it. They, none of them could convict him of sin because he's the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. And he's got a couple of brothers, too, that could testify to this. Like James, the just, who became the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, and Jude, who gave us a short but very powerful epistle, the second to the last writing of the New Testament. Those guys were raised with Jesus. They could confirm his spotlessness. I wonder if that was a bit annoying to these guys. Their older brother, Jesus, could do no wrong. <laughs> but he asked his antagonists, which of you convicts me of sin? They couldn't say anything. Stunned silence. And what else? Denouncement, rejection, suppression, censorship of any who would dare to align themselves with Jesus. Does that sound familiar today? That's what we have today. It says in John, the 12th chapter, that there were many who believed in Jesus, but they would not confess him openly because they didn't want to get booted out of the synagogue. It's sort of like that now. People in the Western world, can you imagine? With our Judeo-Christian ethical foundation and legal foundation, judicial system. It's all sort of centered around Judeo-Christian philosophy and ethics. It's what made the Western world a good place to live, and people vote with their feet, and they flee these horrible countries that don't have Christianity as an influence, and they all flock here. Isn't it awful to think that we've knocked out the foundation? Really, prayer is not in school anymore, of course, and and you're, it's almost illegal to pray in public. It is in some place. Don't you dare pray outside an abortion clinic. Get arrested. And yet they still want all the benefits of this Judeo-Christian foundation that we had. It won't work. Knock out the foundation. The whole edifice will fall. But we are denounced. We are ridiculed. We are censored. But you know what the last phase is in all this? It's physical violence. That's what they did to Jesus. Denouncement and ridicule and censorship and all the rest of it. And then finally, they couldn't stop him, so they had to kill him. And that's what they do. That's what the bad guys do. By the way, can we just say it? You've, you've watched it on your, uh, on your TVs, on your phones, on your tablets. You've watched it. I'm thinking of President Trump. Like him or hate him, it doesn't matter. The fact is, everything but the kitchen sink was thrown at that man until finally bullets were fired in his direction. And that's the same pattern. That's what the bad guys do. It's the same pattern, the same treatment. 
All of God's faithful ministers will face such things. Jeremiah faced those things. And all his apostles faced those things too. Even John. John's the only one who died of old age. But he faced horrible persecution, even exile. So you know, you know the territory. Jesus said, if you're going to build a tower, think it through. Do you have the resources? If you're a military general, think it through before you engage in battle with someone if you have the resources to win the, the, the war. And if you're going to become a Christian, think it through. Because the whole world lies in the sway of the wicked one. And Jesus said, beware when all men speak well of you. I think that you should watch out when that happens because probably you're doing something wrong. The world couldn't get along with Jesus. Do you think it'll get along with you? Me? Not hardly. No. Now, Chapter 2, verse uh, 6. Verse 6. Neither did they say, Where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt? I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness, but when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, Where is the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Therefore, I will yet bring charges against you, says the Lord, against your children's children. I will bring charges for pass beyond the coasts of the Cyprus of Cyprus and see, send to Kedar and consider diligently and see if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. I just want to stop and think about these serious charges that God is bringing against his covenant nation. He says the fathers, the people, the priests, the rulers, they're all in a perpetual state of willful ignorance concerning Israel's redemptive history. They don't want to hear about the Exodus. They don't want to hear about Moses. They don't want to hear about supernatural sign, judgments and miracles, how God brought them out of slavery with an outstretched hand. They don't want to hear it. And they're in a state of perpetual, willful disobedience when it comes to the law. They don't want to know what God has to say about how to conduct yourself in a morally upright fashion. They've cast those things behind them. And really, friends, nothing has changed from that hour to this. Look at verse 8. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. Focus on that. Can you imagine people with Bibles and are teaching the Bible to others and they don't even know God? And that's where we're at right now in the Western world. Anyone hear of Bart Ehrman? Bart Ehrman is an absolute, staunch, diehard atheist. He teaches New Testament in some university. The, the name of the university escapes me, but he is world class. He is respected around the globe as someone who knows the New Testament. He's got it memorized in Greek. It's transmissional history, he knows. He knows more than 99% of the Christians out there, I'm sure about the Bible, and he doesn't know the Lord Jesus, refuses to know him. Nothing has changed. Jesus Christ stood up and he confronted the religious leaders of his day, those who handled the law, and he said, you know neither me nor my father, for if you had known me, you would have known my father also. That's John eight nineteen. Isn't that ironic? They're handling the Bible. They've got the scrolls there in the synagogue. They're reading them. They're, ex they're expounding on the scriptures. They don't even know God, because if they did, they would have recognized his self-disclosure, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the same today. I'm picking on CMU this morning. When, when Nathan came for prayer yesterday, he said, can you pray for me? It's difficult. He has a teacher that came right out in front of the whole class and said, well, of course the Bible isn't from God. Comes right out and says it. You don't have to guess about what this teacher believes. She comes right out and tells you. <laughs> and I've had my own experiences with that place. And I had two profs, PhDs, one of them professor of Old Testament, the other one, uh, I think it's um, molecular biology or something, or biochemistry. Both of them theistic evolutionists. They said God created the world through evolution, which involved a process of trial and error. Trial and error. Really? 
The Bible says everything God made was good. He looked at it, he said it's good. Trial and error, they said. They told us that Genesis 1 to 11 was, quote, fiction, unquote, fiction, and that the Apostle Paul, who obviously believed in Genesis 1 to 11 because he said so in 1 Timothy chapter 2, they said that Paul was in error and he inscripturated that error into the Bible. So the Bible's not, not completely true. Not like Psalm 119 verse 160 says, God's word is true from the beginning. They deny that. They deny that. They denied the physical resurrection of the believer. You, you and I believe that Jesus Christ rose bodily from the dead. He left an empty tomb behind him. In Luke 24, he appeared to his astonished disciples. They, they shrieked in terror. They, they thought he was a spirit. He said, do you have anything to eat here? He said, handle me and see. A spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. That man rose bodily from the dead. And he is the first fruits of them that slept. And Paul gave you 58 solid verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to tell you that you're going to raise bodily from the dead also. You will be raised to glorified life. Doesn't Paul tell you in Philippians, the third chapter, we're waiting for Jesus to come from heaven. That's where our citizenship is. And he will do what? He will transform your vile, lowly body and fashion it like unto his glorified body. Not, that's what the Bible says. These men said, impossible. Because a man's body is 70% water, and how is God supposed to gather up all that water and reconstitute a person? Too hard for God, they said. You've got to be kidding me. You know, I'm not just picking on these guys. They're just one of many, right? But that's what you get when you go there. And I remember sitting in the class and arguing with those guys every single class, and it suddenly dawned on me. I shouldn't expect too much from them, really. They don't know him. They don't know Jesus. If they knew Jesus, they would never talk like this. They don't know him. And nothing has changed. We have people standing in pulpits expounding the scriptures that don't know God. I'm sorry to say. So, you know, I talk to people, they're looking for a church, and I say, well, come to our church, and I'll preach the Bible the best I know how, and I know him. Now, I want to know him better, like the Apostle Paul said. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. But I know that I know him. And I've had long talks with God. And he has answered prayer. And he steps in. And he does things. And he's not some abstraction you adopted by the mind. He's a living, personal agency with a mind, will, emotions, and an opinion. And he intrudes into our lives and he does things. And you've got to know him. Because John 17, 3 says that knowing God is life eternal. That's what Jesus said. And if you don't know him, you don't have life. Right? And that's like serious. And you either know him or you, or you don't. And it says here in verse 8 that the people walked after things that do not profit, things that don't profit. Either God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is our ultimate point of reference for all things, or he's not. It's creator or it's creature. Because something will be that for you and for me. Something's got to be your point of reference to determine whether things are true or false, right or wrong, good or bad, you have to measure those things against some kind of standard, and it's either the creator himself or it's some creature. It's God or something else in the world. But I want to say, friends, that only the God of the Bible can make your life meaningful, really, in an ultimate sense. Only God can make your life meaningful. Only God can make your experiences intelligible. Only God can grant you significance and security and purpose. Only God can give you certain hope in this world because nothing else will do. You need the word of an all-powerful, omnibenevolent God who does not lie to talk to you and to talk to me, to guarantee certain things, to make rulings on certain things that we need instructions on. You need it. I need it. You can't live without God. And you know, friends, the tragedy is that Israel had it all. Israel had that. God wanted to be that for those people, but they turned away from him, just like Adam did in the garden. Adam chose something else, and it was disastrous. Through one man, sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death has passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And Israel followed original man. Adam's horrible example turned away from God to something else. And here's tragedy upon tragedy, verse 11. Look at verse 11. Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. 
You know what the sad thing is? The cultists out there, the false religionists, those who walk in religious darkness and ignorance, those people are more faithful to their fakey gods than many professing Christians are to theirs. He asked them, he says, has a nation changed its gods? Well, the, the implication is no. They are true to their gods. You remember those uh, prophets and priests of Baal that squared off against Elijah? They're saying, oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us, chanting to their god all day long. And they're so committed to getting some sympathy from their reluctant god, they began slashing themselves open so the blood could gush out. So their god surely will see this and he'll respond. See? They're, they're more faithful to their fakey gods than professing believers in Jehovah. Horrible. Sad commentary on Israel and on professing Christendom. And of course, this is very, very serious because we know better. In 2024, the Western world ought to know better. Just like Judah. Judah in the south, it's, it's getting all these stern warnings from Jeremiah. They saw Israel's defeat and subjugation at the hands of the Assyrians. They watched it happen. They watched the religious, religious defection the moral depravity, the faithlessness, the covenant breaking, they watched it all happen. And then they watched Assyria march right across the map over to Israel in 722 BC and obliterate the whole thing, drag everybody off captive. And they should have learned something. A hundred years later, it's like they learned nothing from that. Look, please, at chapter 3 and verse 9. Chapter 3, just zip ahead here. 3. Nine, speaking of Israel, three nine. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, says the Lord. You know what we call that? We call that religious hypocrisy. People claiming to be holier than thou, they claim to know the Bible, they even use the Bible to justify their life choices. And it's all selfish, and it's all fake. It's phony. It's religious hypocrisy. And Jesus targeted these people. In Matthew, the 23rd chapter, he had hard words for the religious but the lost, the ones who claim to be so holy and righteous. He said, you people are devouring widows' houses Right? Selfish, self-absorbed, greedy, stepping on other people. You don't, you're certainly not preferring others above yourself. And for a pretense, you make long prayers. So people will look at you and think that you're so holy. And Jesus, you know what Jesus said to those people? You have just earned for yourselves the greater damnation. Greater damnation. Oh, there's gradation in hell. Not everybody's punished the same. Because they knew better. That's the point. They knew better. And, and, you know, friends, uh, you've got to be careful with this one. There are people that uh, reject Christianity, and they say, because, well, the church hurt me, and there were hypocrites in the church. Well, of course, that's a rough and ready excuse for the unregenerate who has an inbuilt hostility to God, right? They don't, don't want to know God anyways, and that makes a pretty good rough and ready excuse. I say, church, don't give them that excuse. Let's not be a bunch of hypocrites. Let's be people who believe in God with our whole hearts and we strive to believe Him and obey Him. And you know, you know friends, we all, we all mess up. We all sin from time to time. That's a fact. But we don't pretend to be something we're not. You know, We direct people at Jesus. We direct people to the Bible. There you're going to see perfection. right? Look at me, you won't see perfection. I'm trying. You're trying. We're, we're making progress under God. Yes, that's true. But we are not the standard, and we don't make the rules, and we didn't write the Bible. We direct people to Jesus Christ. We readily admit we're not perfect. We don't claim to be. But he is. We insist that he is, and so is his word. So we're not going to be hypocrites here, okay? Now, if you go to chapter 4 and verse 22, I'd like us to look at 4, uh, 22. Where are we here? Yes, 422. Look at this. My people are foolish. They have not known me. They are silly children. They have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. 
this is absolutely God has determined to be inexcusable. This is absolutely inexcusable. These people had God's law, and they had God's presence among them, manifest in a unique and spectacular way, powerful way, in the temple, which was the center of the religious program. But what about us? We, we are way more advantaged than those people. We don't just have the Mosaic Law. We have the whole Bible now. Genesis to Revelation, all of God's inscripturated revelation. There won't be any more. We have it all. And you have God's abiding presence in the person of the Holy Spirit who has taken up residence inside you and me. What a tremendous advantage. You know what Jesus said? To the one who's been entrusted with much, much will be required. You ever think about that? I think about that. I shudder when I think about that. For real, every Bible study aid, every commentary, everything's at our fingertips. There is no excuse for my comparative ignorance of the Bible, dear friends. I feel conviction sometimes, too. But he is, uh, Jeremiah here, under God, is pointing out that God's people have become foolish, silly children without understanding. And now I'm going to pick on the hyper-charismatics, the health and wealth prosperity heretics. These churches where... uh, It's all fun and games. People are dancing around. They're laughing uncontrollably. They're rolling around in the aisles. They're barking like dogs. It's all fun and games, and the Bible sits closed. Who's who's uh, expounding upon the Bible? Who's exegeting the scriptures? The Bible contains all the words of this life. What is going on here? The Church of Jesus Christ has become some kind of adult daycare. And when you say to these people, who's... Who's teaching the Bible? How are you going to get God's word? They've got prophets. They've got prophets. In my estimation, fakey prophets with a fakey message, anything to keep the dollars coming in, anything to make people feel good and keep coming. By the way, major, major theme in Jeremiah's prophecies. He's contending with the false prophets. Jeremiah's teaching a serious message, very serious. Repent, or it's going to be horrible for this nation. Get back to the law. Get back to God. You know, to the law and to the testimony. And the fakie prophets are saying, we're safe. Don't listen to him. The temple's here. God is not going to send the Gentiles in this, into this city. We have the temple. Don't worry about it. Business as usual. It's okay. Not true. Not true. And it's the same situation we find ourselves in today. Look at chapter 5 now, please. Verse 4. 5-4. Five, four. Chapter 5, verse 4. Therefore I said, surely these are poor, they are foolish, they do not know the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. I will go to the great men and speak to them, for they have known the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. Just drop down to verse 9. Just look at 9 now, please. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? And shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? You read the whole stretch of scripture in chapter 5, and it turns out the common, normal people on the street cannot be reasoned with. You ever experienced that? Remember years ago I was in Regina? They had these big protests. Occupy. They're protesting Stephen Harper. I waded into this big crowd. I started asking people, hey, what are we doing here? Hey, what are we protesting? We've got to stop Harper. What are we stopping him from doing? Well, I'm not sure. You have to talk to that guy with the microphone. You talk to that guy. He's not making any sense. They're all gathered to, re- to resist something they don't even understand. Nobody had the faintest clue why they were there. I couldn't reason with those people. But they're protesting something. Jeremiah faced that. The common people cannot be reasoned with. He said, I'll go to the great people then. Horror of horrors, the great people, those in authority, the intellectuals, intelligentsia, they've decided to abandon God and his ways. It describes our own society today, I think. People don't know God, they don't want to know God. People know about God, they reject it. And so, verse 7, look at verse 7, 5, 7. How shall I pardon you for this? Your children have forsaken me. And sworn by those that are not gods. Just stop there. God says, what can I do for you? How can I pardon you? Remember, God wants to pardon them. That's the point. God wants to pardon those people. He doesn't want to punish them. He said, how can I do this? Why do people go to hell? 
That's not a popular doctrine. Hell, oh, I don't want to talk about it. Why do people go to that awful place? They go there, friends, because God is salvation. And if you reject him, and people do, there is no recourse. How could, what's he supposed to do? He said, I'm your salvation. They say, well, we don't want you. What's he supposed to do for people? God reluctantly gives them their desires, and they go into a Christless eternity. He himself, in the person of his only begotten son, Jesus, is the only avenue to forgiveness of sins and to reconciliation with a holy God. He is the only way to life everlasting, Jesus Christ. And that's it. Our last verse, I just very quickly here, is Jeremiah 6, verse 16. I'd like us to look at that, please. 6, 16. Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. I'm just going to stop right there. Sometimes, friends, the most helpful and progressive thing you can do is back up and go, and go back. If I'm heading to a goal that's that way and I take a wrong turn and I'm driving now this way, when I realize what I'm doing, the best thing I can do is stop. Don't just keep driving. You ever been on the highway and you have a deep suspicion you're going in the wrong direction? And foolishly, we just keep driving. You ever do that? <laughs> stop. Just stop. And look at your GPS or look at your map. And you know what? The most progressive thing you can do is to turn around and go backwards. Go to the place where you got off the, the path and get back on the right path. Abraham, the father of the faithful, had to do that. There was famine in the land of Canaan, and he left the land. He went to Egypt. God didn't tell him to go there. He left the altar that he had built to God. He left God there, went into Egypt. And you know what, what, you know what happened in Egypt? Disaster happened. It was not a blessing. It was a curse. It, and Abraham did the best thing he could have done. He, he went back to where he left God. Many of us are walking strong right now. We're feeling pretty good, but I bet you I'm talking to someone who's messed up. Maybe someone who's listening to my voice online. I don't know. I'm telling you right now, go back to where you left God. Pick up. He's waiting for you. He'll help you. Go back. The whole culture, I say, needs to go back to an age of faith. We've lost it. Canada's lost it. Go back. It's progressive to go back to the age of faith. Go back where you find the good way. And the good way is not an abstraction. It's not an idea. It's not a philosophy that you adopt with your mind or something. The good way is a living personal agent. He's the son of God himself. He's Jesus of Nazareth. He identified himself as the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, come to me in Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me and I'll give you rest. That's the promise here in Jeremiah six sixteen. You will find rest for your souls. So my encouragement to everybody who hears my voice is to come to Jesus and bring everything you got to him. Bring it all. Don't hold anything back. You're laboring and you're heavy laden. Bring it to Jesus. Stop carrying your sin debt around. That takes energy. He'll take it right off of you. Stop carrying your guilt about the past. Stop carrying your shame. You don't need to carry that anymore. You can bring it to Jesus. He'll take it. He'll nail it straight to the cross and you'll never have to pick it up again. You don't have to carry fear about the future around anymore. Jesus has taken care of the future for those who love and trust him. Stop working to pay off your sin debt yourself. You can't. It's exhausting and it won't help you. Stop trying to distract yourself with all kinds of meaning, meaningless things so you don't have to think about judgment, God, his law that you've broken. Just forget all that stuff. It takes energy, it wears you down, and it's not helpful. Jesus said, bring it all to me. Peter said, cast all your care upon him, he cares for you. That's, that's my message to anyone who hears my voice. And I can tell you, if you do it, he changes things for you. He changed things for me. He's changed things for my family. And I know enough of you to know that that's your redemptive history too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, now, in the precious name of our beloved Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we come into your presence. 
We want to thank you today, Lord, for your precious word, the Bible, that's not always an easy book, not always easy to understand, not always easy to read and to feel the conviction from, and not always to, easy to receive correction, and it's not always easy to preach it to others, Lord, but we thank you for your grace that we're able to do these things. We pray that your precious word will accomplish its life-changing work in all of us and in all those who hear this message. Going into the future, we don't know how many people are going to hear this, but we pray that whoever does, they will respond affirmatively to the things that we've explored today. And Lord, now we just want to commit every care of ours to you for your tender care and ministry as individuals, as homes and families, and as a church community in, in this place. We ask God that your grace and favor would rest upon us continually. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, God bless you all, everyone. Thank you so much.